Okay, so anyway, this ice age had <coughs> huge glaciations, and then there were times where there were no glaciers at all, things melted out, and then there were smaller glaciations. And over the last million years or so, the Earth has been experiencing, generally speaking, 100,000 year cold periods sandwiched between 10,000 year warm periods. That's just the way the cycles have been. Which is interesting because the end, the official end of the Pleistocene, of the Great Ice Age, was 10,000 years ago. So if we're on this cycle, we've just we've just finished our 10,000 year warm period and we should be starting our next 100,000 year cold period. Which is just kind of an interesting thing to ponder. Um, these glaciers melted out. That water, remember water carved this canyon in the first place. What's happened when these massive glaciers melted out is that meltwater eroded the bedrock above Yosemite Valley, eroded the bedrock into fine sediment. That sediment would have been suspended as long as it, in the water, as long as the creeks or rivers are going down slope, right? Well, once the rivers hit the valley floor here, they slowed down, that sediment load dropped. And we had some geologists come here and do, uh, using ultrasonic sound, they measured the depth of the sediment. And what they found is this, is if this, let's say, this represents Yosemite Valley, my curve sheet here. What they found is Yosemite Valley, the bedrock, bottom of the valley is not flat like this, it's ramped like this. So if Half Dome is over here on the eastern end, so there's Half Dome, let's say Half Dome's over here, and El Capitan is down here, um, you've got this kind of ramped bedrock floor. And what's happened is the sediment is basically piled up like so. So when you travel, when you leave Yosemite Valley, you guys are going to um, cross Pohono Bridge, it's the last well, you'll drive right past Palmer Bridge, and that's where you get bedrock over here. But on the east end, using these ultrasonic sound tests, they calculated that there's about 2,000 feet of sediment. Wow. So really pretty. Which means, at one time, we were about as deep as the Grand Canyon, if you were standing up at Glacier Point. Yeah. Glacier Point's about 3,000, a little over 3,000 feet above the valley floor here. If we took that sediment out, dug down, there'd be another 2,000 feet. So, contenders with the Grand Canyon. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. It's really cool. We're very competitive in yes. this park. Very competitive. We've noticed that. Yeah. It's not, not the only park that's yeah, competitive. Yellow, yellow, Yellowstone? Yeah, first national park. Oh, yeah. We had the idea first. <laughs> so, um, so, anyway, um, when these glaciers came down, in very short order, they widened the valley, they deepened the valley, they, and when they came down, they basically plucked rock from the walls and the bedrock floor of that rock became embedded in the glaciers. And, and then the glaciers, of course, transport that rock like a giant conveyor belt, just like your uh, supermarket conveyor belt where all your ice cream and cookies pile up at the very end. <laughs> um, you, you can see when you drive out of Yosemite Valley, when you guys head back up to Tuolumne, um, just past El Capitan, there's a big meadow in El, El Capitan and you leave that meadow and all of a sudden you're in forest. And if you look very carefully, you can see one of these moraines. There's a couple of them that have been deposited. <coughs> and that's the two ways that glaciers have uh, profoundly affected this environment, this the bedrock. Well, one, they they literally sculpt the rock, they pluck that rock, and then they take that rock and they transport it and deposit it somewhere else. Um, so it's taken from here and adding over there. So you can check out those moraines on your way out of the valley. Um, and actually, you, you guys should stop because you can, what's really cool <coughs> is on that moraine just past El Capitan, it's called the El Capitan Moraine, um, if you walk out on that moraine, you can find the rock that dominates Tuolumne Meadows. It's very distinctive. It's got, it's basically this granitic rock with these huge crystals. They're called phenocrysts, and that's Cathedral Peak, what we call Cathedral Peak granite. 
and um, the only way that that particular type of rock could be found down here is through the transport of glaciers. Is that what we were looking at yesterday? Yeah, we were looking at the phenocrysts. Is yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, we noticed those. I was going to ask you about those. And then the other thing we noticed were really big veins of yes. harder material. How does that flow? Yeah. Uh, so when this bedrock was cooling and crystallizing, it cracked. And then infusing those cracks was basically quartz and feldspar. Sometimes they're mixed together and they form what's called the apolite, that's the rock. Sometimes you'll find pure quartz grains, uh, veins, um, and those veins are called dikes. So pothole dome, that's where we is that where you were? Yeah. You, see, you see that all over, the, not yeah. only do you see the phenocrysts, but you also see those um, apolite dikes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was very interesting to look at. It's pretty obvious it was a, a fault line of some sort, but yeah, yeah, what it, what it filled in with, we weren't sure. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Cool. No, that's it is. It's really cool. And that you know the the quartz and feldspar crystallize at a different temperature compared to the other gran the, the greater granite. So it just kind of infuses. Um, what we're going to do now is. Um, we're going to become a little bit, we're going to become much more biological now, but um, like I said, there, I had a couple of events that kind of made me see the geologic light, and one of those was learning how, being a lover of the living world, plants and animals, um, I, I, and I look at everything through, the, um, from an evolutionary perspective, because I just love those stories. The, the neat thing about evolutionary biology, you know, field biology, I was trained as a field biologist. I took all the ology courses, entomology, ichthyology, all that stuff. And all that was really great because it taught me how, you know, how to identify stuff. It, it basically, field biology tells you what. Um, but evolutionary biology, if you couple it with that, evolutionary biology tells you the how and the why. And so, you know, what is this? It's an oak tree. <laughs> Crickets in the background. But now let's look at this. Okay, how did this oak tree become an oak tree? Why is it an oak tree? Where did it, you know, what the evolutionary lineage and that sort of thing. And then, of course, we could be here for hours, days, months, a lifetime just studying that. So, um, so that's where it becomes interesting when you look at how geology affects the biology and that's what we'll I'll share with you at our next stop. Sounds great. Sounds Sweet. good? Okay. So here's a world map. All these green areas have <coughs> something in common. It's I'll give you a hint, it's biological. Um, any idea what all these green areas have in common? Tree species? You're getting warm with trees as the, a plant was the measure of this thing. These are all these are all areas that are that have something in common. And I'm just going to cut to the chase because it could take a while <laughs> to get this. But um, these are biodiversity hotspots. Okay. So, Gosh, I should recognize that. <laughs> do you teach about biodiversity hotspots? Well, yeah. Cool. Well, awesome. So, but I don't recognize them on a map. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, how exactly. often are we? But, you know, these are, um, you know, so bear with me because sure. you know this already probably. probably but um, um, 15, 20 years ago, biologists uh, convened and in the, uh, with the idea of, listen, we need to... We need to know what we have in order to know what we're losing, right? So they started to identify these areas that had exceptional, um, there's our monarch. Yeah. Or was that a swallowtail? I couldn't tell. It looked like oh, a monarch. monarch, there you go, it's orange. Um, so these areas are characterized by high diversity and the measure of diversity was plants. Mm -hmm. So that's, okay. that's where that comes from. And they initially started out with like 15 biodiversity hotspots, and I think the last count was like 34. 
so they've they've more than doubled in number. Um, these hot spots, so there are a couple things, a couple qualifiers. Number one, it's plants that are being measured as is the measure of diversity. Um, two, as a hot spot, they they considered endemism and endemic. So you've got like um, whatever the Ozark Mountains. You know that's a. I remember when I was going to college, they would we'd take um, field trips down there. Um, incredible diversity, but you didn't have the high degree of endemism. So when you look at North America here, I'm not including Central America in this. Um, basically, all you have is California and the southern tip of Florida over here. Those are the biodiversity hotspots. And then you ask yourself, well, um, what, you know, how is that? So why are we so lucky? Um, and I'll get into that um, right now. So how do you, how do you account for high biodiversity? What do you, if you, let's abracadabra, you guys are masters of the universe. And so you get to basically play God here if you want. But what the, the catch is, you don't just make a place diverse. You have to make the right conditions. And then you kind of let nature do its thing. So what would you need? What would one of the things that you would need in order to have high diversity? I think the mountain peaks with the geographic isolation probably played into that. You got it. Um, not only the isolation, but just the peaks themselves. Mm -hmm. So geology, what we say, geology and topography. So um, you know that when you're driving through any mountain range, high elevation mountain range, the ecosystems are basically arranged. If this is your mountain slope, it's kind of arranged like a giant layer cake, right? Mm -hmm. You notice that Tuolumne looks very different from Yosemite Valley. Yeah. You're at like 8,600 feet. We're at 4,000 feet right now. Um, when you drove through the foot, did you enter from the east or the west? Okay, so you are coming from high desert basically. Right. Okay, so on your way down, you're going to go through a, um, two more different uh, ecosystems before you hit the sea level at, uh, on the Central Valley floor. So um, that in itself, this mountain range uplifted, when you go up in elevation, temperatures cool, precipitation increases, you get higher winds which affect the temperature. Um, and that's how you get that layering of ecosystems. Um, um, so geology, topography, um, which is a, a byproduct of the geology, the mountain building. Um, when you look at the this side of the valley, you're looking to the north, but that whole slope is south facing. Mm -hmm. um, you get um, a lot more bedrock over here. Whereas if you look over, well, this is not a good example, really, but when you look um, that side of the valley, which is north facing, it's cooler. You get a different composition of plants. You get sure. many more Douglas firs growing over there as opposed to this side over here. Huh. Um, so, um, so geology, topography, and then the last thing that you need for diversity is you have to have the right climate, right? So if you look down here in Antarctica, there's no biodiversity hotspots. Not only do you need a really uh, uh, nice climate right now, um, but with California, at least, we've had a past history of climates. And here's what happened. I'm gonna, like in one minute, I'm gonna take you guys through 60 million years. We're gonna go back in time 60 million years. And if we were standing at this spot, you would not be standing underneath pines. You'd be standing underneath palm trees and fig trees and avocado trees. You'd be in a neotropical forest. And that's because back then, much of this world uh, um, was covered by neotropical forest. The climate was much more hot and humid. Fast forward to 40 million years ago, the climate starts to cool, it gets drier. And that's when plants that were adapted to colder conditions started to thrive. What happens to those neotropical plants? They start to fade out. Um, now, before I leave that, um, here, come over here for just a second.
give that a whiff. Have you, have you ever smelled that before? Yeah. I can't tell what it is. You it's like very minty. soup or stew? Um, this is bay laurel. Okay. This wow. is not the stuff you typically okay. cook with. Yeah. That's English bay, but this is California bay laurel. Huh. And this is a very special plant because mm -hmm. this is considered a relic of this neotropical flora. Hmm. Um, now, I don't know about you guys, but being a, a fellow Midwesterner, I never got um, into avocados until I came out here. <laughs> you come out to California and avocados. Are you into avocados at all? I love avocados. Yes. Okay. Actually, I thought he was saying it when you said there used to be avocados here. So. <laughs> yeah, I figured he'd just pass out. Uh, <laughs> you eat them plain. You eat them plain? Yeah, that's yeah. fun. You just love. Salt. I'm with you on that. Yeah. I, that's actually part of my lunch today is an avocado. But, you know, having grown up in, in um, Minnesota, I didn't even know what an avocado was. Now, I think part of it is globalization and all that. Yeah. There's a lot more. But back then, geez, there was. I don't even know if the store had avocados. Maybe they did. Um, anyway, I'm off topic. This this is in the same family as avocados is what I'm ultimately okay. getting at. And an avocado is a neotropical plant, right. so it makes sense. So this is a relic. Uh, we've got a couple more of them in the state. When you go, if you go down to Southern California, we have something called a Washington palm. That is a relic of this neotropical flora. Um, so by and large, when the climate started to cool 40 million years ago, that neotropical plant uh, flora started to kind of fade out. Um, the, the colder climate brought in what we call the Arcto-Tertiary Geoflora. Please, let's not get bogged down with the terminology. Let's just talk, call them an Arctic flora. Plants that are adapted to cooler and drier enter most of what you're looking at right now. Pine trees, fir trees, um, sequoias, redwoods, um, hemlock trees. You know, this is these are all cold adapted plants. Um, there are also broadleaf trees, like the oak trees that you see on the other side of the meadow, oak, oak uh, beech, um, um, birch, uh, the list goes on and on. So you have these broadleaf trees. Now what's interesting is when you come to the West Coast, what's happened is most of um, the broadleaf trees have, we don't have really great diversity in that broadleaf category. Mm -hmm. East Coast has great assortment of broadleaf trees. They've lost their conifers. West Coast, we've lost our broadleaf trees. We've amped up the conifers. So that's, it, it's just kind of interesting how that's, that's worked out over time. Um, so uh, now we've got this landscape being dominated by these cold adapted plants and then something happens 10 million years ago. Climate starts to get hot, it starts to get dry. Now note the time, I'm not even at the ice age yet. I'm talking 10 million years ago as opposed to the onset of the ice age 2 million years ago. But 10 million years ago, a Mediterranean climate starts to insert itself into California. And these Mediterranean climates are very rare. There's only five worldwide. You're in one of them right now. Now let me point out the Mediterranean climates and you're gonna notice a correlation. So here we are in the Northern Hemisphere, Mediterranean climate. Here's the Mediterranean, notice mm -hmm. hot spots. Mediterranean climate in Chile, South Africa, and the southwestern side of Australia. Hmm. All the same latitude, both Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere. All five of them biodiversity hotspots. So correlation hmm. but between climate and biodiversity. Hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so that is what we call the three major geofloras that have brought plants in and simultaneously evicted plants. Think of it as like waves, these surges of climate as waves uh, lapping against the shore where those waves bring in some detritus and plant it and then at the same time they bring some stuff off the beach. That's kind of how climate has worked here. Um, and it just so happens that the combination of latitude, how far north or south you are, 
in chorus with this uplift of the Sierra Nevada mountain range has allowed some of these plants to basically use California as a sanctuary because when this Mediterranean climate hit California 10 million years ago, that cool, those cool temperatures started to disappear. 10 million years ago is when the Sierra Nevada starts to accelerate its uplift. So where are these cold adapted plants going to thrive? The upper elevations. With that new Mediterranean climate that has moved in, what happened is what came with it are plants from Mexico and the southwestern United States. So when you guys leave tomorrow, when you start heading down towards Monterey or Point Reyes or whatever, when you drive through the lower foothills, you're going to see that um, this plant community called chaparral. It's basically vast shrublands, mm -hmm. and that those shrubs are basically manzanita, chamise, a handful of other plants, and all of them came out of Mexico and the southwestern United States. Mm -hmm. And now that is what dominates at the lower elevations of California. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So here you have um, climate that has been responsible for great biodiversity and then to really wow you here is is the, just a couple of uh, points of fact here we've got um, over 5,000 different species of plants in California um, I could call Canada right now think of a landmass the size of Canada what do you got Canada they don't have 5,000 different species of plants we've got this little sliver called California we've got great diversity um, 24% of these plants that you find in the state, 24% of them are endemics. Wow. That's mm. huge. Yeah. And that's the other qualifier for being a hotspot, right? Not only do you have to have a lot of plants, you have to have a high degree of endemism. Right. And um, the reason for that is, well, you might be able to figure it out. What would be a geologic reason for high endemism? Barrier. They can't go east. Bingo. Across the desert. You got it. <laughs> I mean, and desert, can we put that in quotes? Desert <laughs> as in, I mean, our alpine environments are essentially desert. If, right, you, right. if, if you consider, you know, the viable right. water is only available for about two months. Yeah. The rest of the year it's frozen, right? Yeah. So you got desert to the east uh, produced by high mountains. You at, at literally have deserts to the south, right? You've got the moat to the west. And then the farther north you go, the colder it gets. Yeah. So these plants have literally been trapped here. Yeah. And that's why we have such a high degree of endemism. Um, 